and you're both in priest outfit. That is hysterical yes. because it was well, only we're... one scene in Face Off that that happened. It was such an iconic scene uh, when we were filming that. Where was that? I think it was downtown in the L.A. Convention Center. Uh, I believe it's where we are filming that scene. I, I'm going to have to look at the call sheets, which I kept. But uh, I believe that that's where we're filming that, that, that scene. Listen, and people kept asking us, we did something on our channel to where we were like, hey, guys, we're trying to figure out what, what movie do we think you think we're doing? People were like Sister Act, The Exorcist, this, that, and the other. And then when they found out it was Face Off, they was like, it was just one scene. I was like, well, it's one of the most iconic scenes ever. <laughs> and who doesn't want to be Nicolas Cage? That's all I'm saying. He was, he was just brilliant in that scene. It was perfect. He made it all up. You know what I mean? It was not scripted. He just like, he ad-libbed it all and he felt like it was going to work. From what I see, he edits in his own mind. He's editing his own scenes to work with the next scene or the previous scene in his own head. So if he if he makes it up on that spur of the moment, it's because he knows that it's going to work for the next segment of the film. I, I love what you're doing. And before we get too far into it, like, do not lose this energy, because I'll be honest with you. You are. When I said it's going to be a conversation, you jumped right into it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say three numbers. You've heard them before. It's called three, two, one. His attraction to the Hollywood lights led him to pursue a career as an actor, ultimately landing a sweet decade. That's 10 years for my people, Roman numeral kids. I know they don't teach it in school anymore. As Nicolas Cage, official stand in, which he recently produced a documentary called Uncaged, a stand in story. These days he works in investing, but his love and appreci appreciation for cinema is still very much alive and expressed through his po podcast called Babble, Bullshit and Beyond. A picture is worth a thousand words and he has a thousand pictures. Check out his website seriously. And uh, we're going to do our best to dig into as many great stories behind them as possible today. So I want to say thank you to very much to the Marco Kyrus for being here today. I will never call you Nicholas K. Stand in. You are Marco Kyrus because I'm an actor. We are no one stand in. You are awesome, sir. Thank you for coming on TTFT. How the hell are you doing today, sir? I'm fucking honored is what I am. And I'm perplexed by it all. And uh, but it feels fun and funky and 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 goodsy. <laughs> I like the royalisms right out the way. I love yeah. it. <laughs> You're the son of Greek immigrants, raised in Canada. You moved to Hollywood to follow your attraction to the glitz and glam of the film industry. I got that impression while going through your collection of pictures on your website that you are not just somebody that works in film, but you're somebody that really appreciates the process and really all of the aspects of it. Because looking at your pictures, it was like it was it was it was like images that I would have taken if I were if I had the privilege of being on the film sets that you were on, just like capturing these moments in time. But your your first your move to uh, Hollywood at first didn't work out as you as as you'd hoped. Um, you ended up moving back. Can you tell us a little bit about because uh, uh, mostly our show is for actors, aspiring filmmakers. So we're really interested to hear about the stories of the the struggle and how how other people can or might relate to that and what ultimately led to Nick Cage. Well, that's 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 just a long-winded uh, answer. Uh, first of all, to long long question. What are you guys drinking? Well, he's drinking Blue Moon because we're switching roles here. Okay. Normally, I'm the drinker, and we're both the connoisseurs, if you will. But he's uh, he's drinking today. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. It's because it's six o'clock out there, and I've got water, and uh, I just had coffee, so I'm I'm good. I'm, I'm on a lot of coffee I've had today, so. <laughs> Well, he's normally on coffee or we're, we're both on it. So somebody has to look out for each other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the story is very typical. Uh, it's not a, it's not a unique story. It's like anybody else who goes into Hollywood and, and thinks that they're going to make it or they take acting classes and everybody ends up in a restaurant or, or something um, to fund their 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 lifestyle, just like to pay the rent and stuff. It's, it's very typical. And uh, there was nothing special about that. Um, other than I realized I sucked as an actor and um, I sucked in acting class and I sucked when I got a couple of parts here and there. And, uh, and I gave myself till I was about 30 years old. I think I got there. I went in and out from the age of 25 to 30. Uh, I came and went out of LA and I was in and out of like, am I going to make it? Am I not? Am I good? Am I not good? What was happening? Um, a lot of stuff was also happening because I had to leave the country 
um, a couple of times because I was illegally living there, which uh, wasn't a good thing. So and then I got caught and went to jail. That's all in the book, which will be coming out hopefully next year. Um, I'm rewriting it. But uh, that was that was a big part of it. Then once I, you know, landed in jail and had to leave the country, blah, blah, blah. Stupid things happened. Uh, I kind of gave up everything. I went back to Canada. I went to Vancouver this time and things didn't work out there either. And um, then I won uh, what they call the green card lottery guys in the late, late 1980s. And, um, and it was for certain applicants of certain countries. And it's actually a lottery. If you win, you actually get a green card. And, uh, and my old man who couldn't speak a word of English would see it in the, in the papers in Toronto. And uh, he, and you could, you could enter this lottery as often as you like. And, uh, and if you win, you win. And so he would go to the post office every day, like a old Greek immigrant dude, and would just like walk out there and put a, a mail and a stamp in there with, with this form. It was never filled. It was just the same name. And I, lo and behold, I won. And, uh, and I, I won the green card lottery um, within six months. Then I had to go through a whole rigamajiggy thing. And then I came back to L.A. to see if I would make it. And, uh, and I realized I was even worse than I was when I first got my SAG card over a couple of terrible films. One was called Terror Squad where I played a, a Lebanese terrorist, uh, which actually got me my SAG card to begin with. And, and you know, the whole thing was kind of like weird and wacky, but I was your typical field actor, but I, I thought that, oh my God, I'll, I know I'm gonna make it, somehow I'll make it, this and that, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, as it turned out, of course, I didn't make it. And uh, at the time in the eighties though, guys, um, my look was not in. The only person who looked like me in TV shows or on films were actually like terrorist looking guys or John Stamos was on a, was on a soap opera, but everybody else was very waspy white. And mm -hmm. uh, I would always go in for a role to play your typical Jersey WAP. It was always that kind of a look or you played a terrorist. That was the look. There was nothing else. I was too dark to play this Latino thing. And secondly, there's so many Latinos out there who, who can play those roles. Um, and, uh, and it was very difficult. So they really were looking for people like me back then. Today, I'm part of the, uh, part of the group. Anybody of any color and any background and any race now has an equal opportunity to actually succeed as long as you have talent. Mm -hmm. uh, but back then, it was really a visual. And that. if you look at all the TV shows, all the actors on those shows were either white or black. And, uh, and that's pretty much the way it was. I mean, you know, you guys know your TV and your film and very few Arabs or Italians or Greeks. The Italians always played mobsters. Greeks always played like they had a diner and some greasy spoon of bullshit. So yeah. really the roles were minimal. So there was no way to ever make money to, to see that you're actually going to succeed, even if you were good. So when I realized that, I saw, OK, this is not working out. It's time to go home. And then the riots kicked in in 92 and so forth and all that kind of crazy stuff. Um, and when that happened, I decided that was it. I'm done. Uh, I wasn't getting into parts. Uh, nothing was good. Um, the times were rough. Um, there was, uh, you know, the, the economy was in the shits in the early 90s. And I was a broke, bankrupt waiter uh, who couldn't get a job to do it. I couldn't even get a job as a waiter that point this is even after i got my green card and went back to la guys so let me get this straight okay so because this is a perfect set where you have your green card your sad card and you can't get work so what i want to tell people is this is that when you and you know this you know you know this and i know this when most people say they want to be an actor they either think they're going to be a star they think they're going to be a co-lead or they think they're going to be an extra hell at bit, worst case scenario craft services so before we go any further into your career, we want to be sure that people have a full understanding of what it is to have a job as a stand in. Can you explain the common responsibilities that you were tasked with in that position? Because a lot of people don't say, hey, what? Hey, 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 kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a stand in. Yeah. Can you tell them what it's really like. Uh, I, I will. I'll, let me go back to one second as we go there uh, as an actor thing, just to like tap into that thing. The other truth is, is that I didn't give my end all to being an actor. An actor is a real hardworking person like Nick Cage. And I'm going to get to the stand-in point and I'm going to say why the stand-in position was really relevant and very important to me. 
because I, I recognize what actors really did. So when you are a non-actor or a wannabe actor or a wannabe movie star, it's great to be the wannabe. But the hard work was what I didn't know uh, how to do. There was a lot of studying. There's a lot of, you had to like live and breathe um, acting. You had to live and breathe plays and, and film stuff and study things and memorize stuff. And mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much work was involved. It's not like today's reality stars of just bullshit. Like this is the real thing. And this is why those people were successful. As lame as some of them are on screen, the amount of work none of us really saw and that's what got them to that point. So I didn't put in all that work to begin with. So all those people who are wannabe actors, it's an enormous amount of work. You got to work 80 hours a week to get to the point of even getting on a show. So yeah. I just want to make that clear. And I didn't commit to that because I was committing to working to pay the rents and it was very difficult. And, and then I could only do so much. And I had a little talent, which I didn't expand on. Um, so that's that's where I wanted to go with that one. So you really have to work hard. And um, and I don't regret my position or anything because I really wasn't cut out to be an actor. And I think a lot of people get very depressed that they're not going to make it. And then they 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 succumb to drugs, or drinking or some some kind of wacky kind of other lifestyle. And they can't look at themselves in the mirror anymore. Whereas I completely saw myself, dude, you are a lousy actor. You're not putting in the work. You need to wrap it up and go home and figure out your life. And uh, I'm glad you said that. I mean, it's just a really good point because acting is one of those things where if you haven't done it and you're and you're just watching people do it, it's like, oh, I could do that. But it is one of it is like is the great actors make it look as easy as it is for for people that have never done it before to just assume that there's no effort applied. The there's there's yeah it is such a skilled thing and you could tell the difference between somebody that uh is just is applying no craft to it and somebody like christian bale or nicholas cage yeah i i totally agree and and you don't really see that while you're auditioning and while you're doing maybe some some shitty little play or some scene in class as much because you don't know what the other people are doing the other the other actor types who are in your class most people drop out and have another career. They fall back on what they went to school for, or they go into some family business of some sort. Then there's a bunch of others that you read about that kind of fall through the cracks and they all get nuts and, and they go into like crazy stuff and, uh, and they lose their lives and their sense of equilibrium and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. I, like other people, decided, okay, this is not for me. I got to figure something else out and let me go back and restructure from home. And it's very humbling to go all the way home at the age of 30 and go back to your parents, your old bedroom, your old house and have no car and no money and no job because it's the 90s and you're trying to get a job as a waiter. But now I'm in my 30s and um, and I never did go to school because I'm very ADD. So I never I actually went to school. I, I didn't even finish high school I and mean, I just didn't do school. So I didn't have anything to fall back on except for being a waiter, which is what I was and, and a restaurant manager in L.A. And I thought, well, that's all I can do. And that's what I was doing again. So I thought I'll try to get a job and be and go back into the restaurants. As I did that, being back in Toronto, back home, and this is by now it's 1993 going into 1994. Um, you know, there's kind of like a worldwide recession at the time. Um, I'm just in my early 30s. I'm in my prime. At the time, I looked like a model boy. I still had all the you know, I had a, a decent physique. I had a decent face. I had all that stuff going on. I was early 30s, but I was a whippersnapper, but I couldn't get a job. And I was stuck in the immigrant family home, and it was very difficult. Lo and behold, I uh, signed up with an extras agency in Toronto just to make some extra money because I wasn't even making enough money um, as a waiter at the time. And, uh, and that extras agency, because I was already in the unions with ACTRA and with Screen Actors Guild, I never gave up my union cards. I didn't know what was ever going to happen, guys, but I thought it's such a privilege to be a part of those unions, even though I'm really not an actor. I was kind of like a wannabe actor, but I got lucky enough to get in. I got Taft Hartley into both unions, both in Canada and both in the States. And at this point, I had a green card and I went home with a green card. So I had a green card and citizenship in Canada. 
and my union cards in both countries so I can actually work. If something ever came up, I can work. Or you can mm -hmm. do some union background work, whether you're a SAG or you're an actor. So I thought, okay, under the union rates, maybe I'll make some more money and uh, I can pay some bills as an extra. Uh, and the agent sends me out for a stand in go see for Nick Cage. And she says, I think you're a dead ringer for this, blah, blah, blah. She says, but it's a two hour drive uh, to Niagara on the lake, which is close to Niagara Falls. And you have to get out there. And that's where the audition is and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I don't even own a car. I said, I'm fucking broke. I said, I don't have a car and I can't take out one of those big coach buses. She says, that's okay. I have another guy going in for an audition and he has a little putt-putt car and he's going to go in for the uh, for Dana Carvey. And so you're going to go in for Cage, he's going to go in for Carvey and I want you guys to go and nail it. We go in there, we both get the jobs. Um, and he's a dead ringer for Carvey at the time. This guy was an impressionist as well and, and, uh, and a comedian. He he was, he was great. Uh, his name is David. And we're still friends now. And uh, But he drove me. I couldn't go to the audition because I didn't even own a car. I was that broke. And I was, I think, 31 or 32 years old at this point. And I wasn't down on being broke, guys. That's the problem with a lot of people. They hit 28, 30, 32, and they get really depressed. And they start smoking dope. And they start drinking. They get crazy. Me, I like my coffee and my water. I never drank. I was never into it. To me, it fogged my head. So there's no reason to be out of control when the world is already out of control and your career is out of control and your actual life is not in control financially and you have no schooling. So the more control on a sober state of mind that you are, the more chances you have to succeed in anything. So mm -hmm. why take away that other uh, challenge? And that's the way I saw it. So if I could be in control with what I, the little that I have, maybe it's a gateway to something. So yeah. if I was a drinker or a smoker or a doper or this or that, I know that that would have kind of killed me. So I didn't do it. So that's my big, I wish somebody said, why are we so successful? I didn't drink and I didn't smoke and I didn't do drugs. Never even tried a drug to this day. I've never tried pot. So um, they said, how could you be such a church boy? I'm not a church boy as you wear your right. preached outfits, boys. But uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I just looked at everything with a common sense fair everything to me was common sense you remind me of a guy my first actual real i call it my first real film and what i mean by my real film was where you're on set and you're no longer in control telling your friend hey shoot me i got something i want to say like you're like you're working with so many people they're real cameras they're real lights and i remember the cinematographer saying one night we were all watching this has to be back in 2010 the cinematographer this the first actual like legit film i did he says um we were all outside. And I remember I was smoking pot at the time. And he says, uh, not to me, but to everybody out on the couch. I'm like, I, he didn't know at the time. I'm like, dude, even though I smoke pot a million times a day, you're not going to find anybody better than me. My ego was up there at that point. But I remember him saying that. But I remember what he said after that. He was like, I, he's like, he told his best friend. He like pulled his best friend out of there. And he's like, 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 dude, what are you doing? He was like, he was like, I'm just out there smoking with everybody. He was like, man, he's like, no, I'm not doing that because he like it slows me down. And I respected that because listen, there's people who are already lazy on their own. They don't need pot for it. They don't need drugs. They don't need alcohol. But I, I respect what you're saying because of the fact that listen, you you got to know who you are. Like if you don't do pot, don't do it. If you do do pot, do it. But at the end of the day, you got to get the work done. And I respect you for understanding that, hey, this is where I'm at in life. You're not judging anyone. But you, had you been someone else, you wouldn't be where you are, are now. Now, let me ask you this, because you were talking about back in the day. So wait, 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 before you go, before you go into that, well, I think you were getting to the uh, the stand in. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, OK, yes. There you go. You, yes. you keep you keep trying to. You're trying to push him. Oh no, I was no, I love what he was saying that, but that was our first public service announcement. We've had <laughs> people saying do coke on New Year's before. Get we've had guests say that. So I was loving what he was, I was trying to get a PSA in. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, please. So we get the job on the spot. So and it's freezing. So it's winter of 1994, guys. And it's Niagara on the Lake, which is freezing because it's right off the lake. And and I would say it's anywhere between in Fahrenheit, I would say it's probably between plus five to minus 15 every single day. And it's an outdoor night winter shoot. And, and I hate the cold, first of all, um, I, I hate the cold. Secondly, there aren't enough layers for me to wear in life 
I'm Greek blooded. I'm 100% Greek. So to live there and to be outside was going to kill me. So they give us the job. I go back. I tell the agent, I got the job, blah, blah, blah. And then the next day I call her up and I said, I'm declining the job. And she's like, what? I already told him you're going to do the job. You start Monday morning. I said, I'm declining the job. I can't do the job. It's outdoors. I'm freezing. I'm not going to be able, I'm going to have pneumonia and I'll get the flu every day of my life. I, I don't do cold. She went nuts, went on and on and on. I'm going to blacklist you. You're not going to work anymore. You have to take this job. Secondly, it was a lot of money for me at the time. It was about 1500 bucks a week. And think about it in the 1990s to be a stand in and make approximately, that was a lot of money. And I was only yeah. making about 500 a week in the restaurant. And um, lo and behold, she convinced me along with a couple of other friends who were convincing me and, and telling me that you have no career, uh, you have no acting career, you have no principal agent, you've got nothing going on in life, you're in this restaurant, you're making no money, and uh, uh, take the fucking job, freeze a warm, pay off some bills, <laughs> <laughs> pay off some fucking bills, and suck it up, bitch, and just go ahead and do it, and then rest afterwards, because you'll never see these people again, this Nicolas Cage dude or anybody else. So lo and behold, I called the restaurant and I told him I quit and I'd never worked in another restaurant again. So I gave him my black apron and everything else that I had because you know, it was one of those bow tie restaurants. It was a French place. I gave it and I quit on the spot. And two days later, I was on a film set, which I'd never done being a stand in. So, you know, they had to train you and tell you what to do. I got the job because I, I fit the likeliness, the body, the, the the face, the hair. At the time, he was in his 30s. We were both in our 30s, and we had a similar feel about us. And they were dressed up in these bulky clothes on Trapped in Paradise. So all of it was working in, in terms of the physicality where I can do photo doubling as well. I didn't know what any of that stuff was. But the key thing was is that I was in the union, and you can't work as a stand-in if you're not in the union. So as I kept my union card, guys, uh, with Actra and or SAG in the States, I, I was allowed to work as a stand-in. They don't hire non-union stand-ins on union wow. shows. And I didn't know that. And uh, I would never have had the job. So maybe there was somebody else qualified who was non-union, but they're, they're non-union, so they don't get the job. But uh, so I had my Actra card. It was all valid and paid up. So I was paid Actra rates, which was pretty good. And, uh, and then they put you up in a hotel. My very first gig, we were put up in a hotel there in Niagara-on-the-Lake. I was actually in the same hotel as Nick Cage. So we were in the same hotel, and they pick you up with vans, and then you go off and do this, this film in the middle of the night with John Lovitz, Dana Carvey, and Nick Cage, who played those three goofy brothers. And um, I mean, great movie. for starters. But the off-camera stuff between those guys was hysterical because they were all funny together. So uh, off camera. So that part was funny just to watch these three clowns ham it up, you know, off camera until they got on set and did their things. But everybody was freezing. I took the job. I was sick the entire time. People always made fun of me. I would have like a bottle of Tylenol a week, just popping them to the point that I was starting to blow it up. And who knows what kind of cancer I had in my system, but I was getting sick by the hour because it was so cold. And you're standing there for hours to stand in. So what a stand in does, and I was learning on the spot, was they ask you to not talk to the actor, to not uh, you know, do eye contact with the actor, generally speaking. This is a general rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, you basically do whatever the actor does. You're mimicking everything that he does. So you're standing in for the technical aspect of the film. So whatever he does, if he's walking towards the lake and sits down on a bench, for example, and, and lights up a cigarette and smokes and stares off into the wilderness, that's exactly what you're going to do. And you have to do it in the same character, in the motion that the character is in. And so I would study him being the character and they give you a script. So you feel like you're a part of the thing. You read the entire script. Then they have these sides and they're called sides, which is a mini me version of the script of what's being filmed per day. Sometimes it's one page. Sometimes it's three pages. It just depends. And mm -hmm. you look at that and, uh, and then you see your character's name on there. And that's the character that you're in, which in every day was Nick Cage because he was the star of it. So, I had sides every day. I had a call sheet. The call sheet was basically for the crew, and it's a daily um, list of who's on the uh, on the show, from all the crew members, from the director on down to craft service and so forth, right down to the extras. So it's kind of like a summary, and then they give you um, a, a one and two day advance schedule on that call sheet. So you study those things. You you try to memorize as many names as you possibly can in terms of crew. You uh, try to understand what these positions are. 
And the fortunate part for somebody like me to work for a lead actor is you get to be in the entire film. So you're in the continuity of the film. So I don't pop in and pop out to figure out, oh, what are they doing three days from now? Because I missed the first three days or because the actor's not in it. Nick Cage was in every shot and every scene. Yeah. So I had the privilege right from the get-go to understand how a film was being made, how they jump from scenes back and forth and back and forth because Cage was in all of them, and to watch it through the monitor because I was representing the lead actor. In addition to that, so you had to watch him intensely. If he starts to run towards a sleigh, you run the way he runs. And they set up the cameras, whether it's a dolly track with the cameras in his in, in the motion that he does it, in his speed. So whatever he does in that rehearsal, you do as the character, as his character would do it. Sometimes I would start to assume the character's positions because they were small uh, setups. And then I felt mm -hmm. like I kind of had a grasp on it. And then they do the rehearsals with me because I felt like I was kind of on it already. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's just a just still thing. Like if they're sitting in the sleigh, there's only dialogue and sitting in the sleigh. So there's not much, he doesn't need to go and rehearse that or set that up. Like I know mm -hmm. exactly what he's going to do. Sit in the middle and sit on the sleigh. Like what else is he going to do? So, and that would take three to four hours, but you have to be in exact costume um, because the camera wants to feel the, um, not the energy, but the the uh, the mass of the other person as Nick Cage as well. Like I can't be a skinny toothpick and I can't be overweight. You really have to fit fit in that bodysuit, so you can yeah. fill the frame the way Cage does. Um, the bad part is that Cage is has got a V shaped body because he's really a worked out kind of Superman dude, and I'm right. kind of like straight down. So I always wore padded shoulders to really extend my thing. <laughs> yeah. well, Joan Collins, um, even though it was fashionable in the 1990s, I did that. So I just needed to do it because it would fill the frame. And he was so tall. And he was an inch and a half taller than me. And I would always wear lifts, even in the winter, and boots. And that I considered to be job security for starters. But also, it really aids the camera. So when there's a close-up, and he's six foot one, and that's how tall this man is, and plus his boots or shoes or whatever he's wearing, and you're 5'11 and a half, I wear lifts to accommodate that so the camera can actually size you up. So you're not like this, and then he comes in and they have to readjust and readjust. Reverse Tom Cruise. Now, Dave, I don't know if you know this. I know he knows this because he's a stand-in of it. Did you know that Nicolas Cage was all, also once almost Superman? Yes, I did. Oh, you did know that. Were, question, were you almost a stand-in for him in that? I was. I did the costume fitting in that in that outfit. I saw you then. So I met you before I met you. I thought I was a nerd, like a, a like a fan nerd or something like that. So you, you mentioned 1994, but what I'm going to do is uh, 1995, one year after Trapped in Paradise, you'd reprise your stand-in role for Nicolas Cage in Kiss of Death. And I, I've been practicing that, by the way. You like that? Mm -hmm. Kiss of Death. And at what point did it become apparent that you might become, this might become an ongoing thing with you and Nick? Uh, once I did Leaving Las Vegas. So to be clear, I did all those films in one year, 1994. All so of them were shot in 94 and released in 95. Um, okay. Shot them back to back. So he had asked me to, once I was with him for about a month, he was very quiet. He didn't say a word to me. It was freezing fucking cold. In his defense, and people say, oh, he must have been such a cold guy. He's not talkative. Why should the actor go in and talk with all the, the crew members and and uh, and the standards and everybody else? Like he has to focus, first of all, on his line. Secondly, he's got to have that dynamic between the other actors. Um, thirdly, it's minus fucking 20 outside. So everybody wants to shoot their scene and go indoors. And this is a fact. When you put those things together, you understand why he's not a very talkative person at three o'clock in the morning when you're standing by a frozen lake. People are like, oh, he's not talking to you and you're the stand-in. He doesn't have the obligation to talk to me. You know what I mean? That's not his fucking job. And so I always defended that. And people said, oh, you're just being nice. I'm not. Because if I was the actor, I would have done the same thing. Because here's the thing, guys. What if I got fired after two or three weeks because I was an idiot, which happens mm -hmm. all the time. So does he have to go in and chummy up with every standard that comes in for two to three weeks and, and put all that energy forth and hopefully that this guy's going to actually be a decent stand-in? Put, you know, think about it in his shoes. So yeah. and I was cool with all of that stuff. My job was to work for him and not to be a buddy system. And so as it turned out, he came to me on that set and, and asked me to go to his trailer and have a conversation about a, a longevity career 
about working for him. And this was right on Trapped in Paradise. And I immediately say yes, once he asked me, but I didn't really understand what that meant because I also didn't understand this was a full-time gig. I thought it was something very passive. Um, and I also didn't have anything else going on in life, guys, at the time. I think if I did, I wouldn't have taken the job. But I had, first of all, no money. I had no career. Uh, I was being paid somewhat decently at the time. And he said, the next film was going to be in New York. Do you mind putting yourself up? Do you have friends out there? And I said, yeah, I have friends. Could you stay in their apartment? Because it was a low-budget film called Kiss of Death. And uh, But we would like you to be in New York. And uh, we would like you know, to have you there as, as my, as my stand-in. So what I didn't know guys is that he was testing out my ability and my commitment to him. It took me a long time to figure this thing out. Cause I wasn't that, um, I, I didn't think that far ahead. He was already mm -hmm. light years ahead. And what he was doing was building up an entourage. And I had no idea. I just thought it's something out of a whim. And I thought, okay, this is kind of cool. And uh, and I thought the worst case scenario is, okay, I'll put myself on. I'm not going to make any money, but I'll learn about filmmaking. Because while well, you're on a film set and you have the privilege of sitting next to the director and a cinematographer, which nobody gets to, uh, to do unless you're in that position, um, I thought there's a lot to be learned. And yeah. so... I thought, okay, I'll do it in New York. And then the next one was leaving Las Vegas. So I, I achieved what I apparently was supposed to achieve while I was in New York with him, which was a real tough shoot. It's actually the worst shoot I ever worked on. It's a miserable motherfucking shoot. I hated every minute of it. <laughs> tell us how you really feel. Yeah, you know, I can tell you. Let's see, it's going to be very X-rated, but <laughs> overall. But then um, I did very well with it. I was very professional as he was. It was, you know, something you don't want to be on really. And then the next one was leaving Las Vegas, like within weeks. And um, and I had to put myself up in L.A. because it was an extreme low budget film. And I had friends in L.A. because I was that failed actor way back then. So I took that one as well. So this is film number three, all in the same year. I'm really making just enough money to survive. But it wasn't so much about the money's about as it was about the learning curve and the process of filmmaking. Now I'm going into a small artsy fartsy film by some British director I'd never heard of, Mike Figgis. And uh, what felt to me like a high-end student film at the time, um, I stayed at a friend's place, crashed out on the couch like anybody else did, my old buddy here in LA. And, uh, and so I stayed with him, I rented a little car, and it, it was all over the place. We worked uh, six day weeks uh, until we went, went to Vegas and Laughlin, Nevada for about a week. Um, outside of that, the rest of it was filmed in Los Angeles. Um, and it was only like a five week shoot. When, when, I'm sorry, when you, uh, you're you saying like a high end student film and the shooting in Las Vegas for a week, I had heard, and I wonder if you could speak on this, that the, the there were no permits or anything pulled for those Las Vegas shots. Like It was just like they, Elizabeth Shue and Nicolas Cage were really out there in the mix with actual people in public in Las Vegas. Like they didn't know that there was a, a film being made. It wasn't blocked off or anything, correct. right? That's very correct. It was guerrilla filmmaking. That's why I call it a oh, high yeah. film. Um, I had heard and I just I couldn't believe that it was, you know, you had these actors and they were pretty notable actors. These are big time dudes. And uh, and there they were just filming it like off the cuff, all over the streets in the middle of the night. And I just I couldn't believe that I was a part of that. So there was no time to waste. There was like stand on your mark, make sure you have it figured out and don't fuck up. So the pressure was really on on a small film for this kid from Canada to make sure that there are, there are no fuck ups for the cinematographer, the camera operator, the director or anybody else on that set that you knew your marks, you knew your lines, you knew it step into it you knew what he was going to do and and you're done because yeah 32 seconds to film this and then you're out the door and so i caught the gist of it because i was a naturally professional human being and i was on, on every step of the way i i was i was dead on and i think they really appreciated that and it, it went a long way at the end of the film uh where i was you know you know handsomely rewarded later on by Nicolas Cage and by the director who was, you know, all about kudos and thank yous. And I was just doing my job. I didn't realize other people would fuck that up. I took it very seriously. I drove the car. I had that BMW. I drove it on, on several shots for all the setups, not the stunt driving, just the regular driving. Mm -hmm. So I did set up all those driving shots and driving along sunset and sitting there and doing all that stuff. So one of my favorite shots of any, uh, of really any movie that is uh, that 
when he's driving the first time and uh, he's just doing this thing with his hand like this with the as the uh, as the, you know the, the stuff's passing by outside the window and he's just he's it's just one of those Nicolas Cage isms. I don't know where it came from, but it, it works so well. Yeah. Um, just like letting things go. <laughs> I, I, I think he thinks about every little tiny thing and uh, and he and he repeats it. It's not like it's in one shot and not the other. He does mm-hmm. the exact same thing because he's very calculated when it comes to that. Even though it sounds or looks like it's off the cuff, he works it for camera A, camera B, you know, side setups, POVs. He does the exact same thing. So even if it's not scripted, he knows what he wants to do. And uh, it may look like he, it's a one shot deal in one, one, one angle, but it's not. This guy is so calculated and so clever. And I don't think people really realize how smart and clever this man is. He is mm-hmm. so far ahead of the game that he doesn't even talk about all the negativity that comes his way. He just does his thing because he knows it's coming from a headspace that he wants to be in. He dissects and dives into it. And the guy fucking goes into it. And watching him, it's like, I just like, I can't do that. Like, there's no way I can do that. Let me just sit there because I would look like an idiot. Like there's no way that you can do certain things that he's going to do. You can't mimic it. You can't copy it. You look like a fool. And Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about that. Yeah. Silly on camera. So I'm not going to make a fool of myself to try to be that person, especially when he was with the shopping carts and those scenes with, uh, with the drinking and puts the bottles in and all that stuff uh, for leaving Las Vegas. It was, you know, you can't mimic that. You can't play with it. So I just kind of like slowly walk with the cart. Um, mm-hmm. So the camera can see the movement, but not the action. We talked about that. Me, me and me and Durden talked about that. We were like, listen, it's one thing to be a stand in or be an extra to be a lookalike. But for like for Nicolas Cage, like, no, there should be a special category for certain actors that for, for stand ins, because like, dude, how am I supposed to stand in for that? We were talking about hard, how hard it was for John Travolta to, to act like being Nicolas Cage and here you are having to be like like for all his films John Travolta had to do it for one film you have to do it for every film is like so that's why I say you say you didn't have any career you didn't have like no you have a special gift that only certain people would have there's like probably th- two people in the world that can mimic Nicolas Cage and it's you and it's Nicolas Cage so I mean hey. you did have a certain air uh, Nicolas Cage air about you I noticed uh, I noticed it more so now talking to you and in, in uh, over zoom in person Correct. more or less than uh than but but I was first looking at your pictures I noticed in a lot of the behind the scenes pictures you almost have uh would assume like a Nicolas Cage air about just the way you were standing and that he has a, like a certain way that he holds his mouth when he stands yeah, it's almost just like letting gravity do whatever it wants and and he forgot to close it sometimes. And I noticed that you had that a lot in the uh, in the behind the scenes pictures, almost like almost like your your method acting to a degree as as a full time stand in for Nicolas Cage. The truth is, it was it became a full time job. I had accepted within myself that I'm never going to be an actor. And so once you let that part of it go, but now I'm in the union. Remember, I'm still a Screen Actors Guild person. And so you're working under the Screen Actor Guild agreements while you're in the States. And remember, I Mm -hmm. I also have a green card so I can come and go freely. And Nick Cage knew all that. He did all his research before he hired me. It's not that he's like, oh, yeah, you here now. He knew everything about me ahead of time. He did research. They made phone calls. They checked out, you know, am I a good guy? Do I have a driver's license? And I had a California license and I have an Ontario license. And both were very valid. And there were, you know, no points and no DUIs and none of that stuff. A very clear record. So I was actually the perfect person to work for him. And that's exactly what I did. I became the method standard. So if he was wearing that wig in Con Air, I wore the wig in Con Air. And I, you know, so it was, but I took it seriously because I also wanted to please the cinematographer and the director in these shots so it doesn't throw them off. So yeah. you really take it to as best as you can without getting in the actor's face or without distracting the director or the cinematographer while you're trying to, to bring the mood of Nick Cage's character to the camera. And that's mm-hmm. what I was doing as best as I could without looking like a fool and without trying to mimic him because it's fucking impossible. 
Oh, I wanted to talk about his hustle because uh, you would you would be able to speak to this probably more so than anybody as you were literally walking in his every footstep for a good decade. And he it's just I know um, a lot of actors put in work, but he like he puts in a lot of work. Like sometimes Samuel the Jackson amount of work. product that he's able to produce in a single year is just and uh, it's it's just kind of baffling to me, honestly. Like, where how are you doing this? And I was wondering what your perspective of that from from your perspective, what that looked like, and just what was there a time continuum that was broken at any point <laughs> for him to produce like five films in a single year? And they're good film; they're all good performances and good films in their own right. That's the other crazy thing. Every minute that he was awake, he was working on his characters. I saw the finished product as I was on set, guys. But I know that when he was in his trailer, the setups are very long, as you know. When you get into these larger films, like the setups are three hours to 13 hours sometimes. It depends on what it is. And I'm there for all of it. So I don't see the process of him working and, and studying and going through all of it. That's what he does in the trailer or at home whenever they bring him on the set. I'm on there with crew. So as I'm there with crew, I only see the finished product. And then I see if he wants to ad lib something or visually ad lib something that's not on the script because I'm always following the script. And then I, I didn't do something that he's doing. And I'm like, that's not in the script. So like when he does that face off with the whole thing, uh -huh. that wasn't scripted. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm reading it and I'm like, what is, what is that on the monitor? <laughs> I thought, what? <laughs> what? what? There was, it was no rehearsal. He just did it. Yeah. And everybody just stood back. I was there with the writers as well. And everybody's kind of like mumbling what, like what, but he already thinks about how it could be edited. He already, I mean, in his brain, he's already playing with the actors without telling them that he's going to do, do this. They have to react to his spontaneous, I want his face off. And Cassavetes would just jump into it and just take note because he's a pro. And that wasn't in there. And I was like, What's going on? And we're behind the monitor. You could see everybody's like watching. And then we're like, wait, what happened? Nobody says a word until the director calls cut. And then they do it again and again and again. And it's it's like, oh, wow. And then you get sucked into it, even though you're part of the crew. You're standing there. You've got the, the writers. You've got other crew members and cinematographer. And everyone's like, huh, what's what's happening here? And you're just watching it. And I'm like. Holy fuck, that's amazing. That is fucking brilliant. But you don't think about it until it's kind of like done because he thought about it. So this mm -hmm. guy's already 10 steps ahead of everybody else. He's going to direct right. himself in the character that he thinks it's, it's right. And he does it. He's pretty, I mean, he studies it himself. So when he brings it on set, nobody knows. There's no way I can do that. Then once it's already done, you go to a close up. Yeah, I do this thing. Sure, but he's already done it, and I didn't rehearse it that way because I didn't know he was going to do it. Uh, oh man, he is on that, level. and uh, and you can't. It's hard to second guess him, you know. But you just follow what he does as best as you can. I, I, I just feel like he's that one actor that has directors like, did I did I write this right, or, or you know, say did I did I direct this right? Like I just oh, wow, I mean, it's, well, it's amazing. <laughs> since we're in Face Off, I wanted to ask. Uh, INDB lets us down probably about 30%, 50% of, of the time Thank you. Um, with their trivia. So uh, we saw on your website photos of Nicolas Cage's birthday cake on set, uh, something that appears to be a running theme I saw across multiple productions. But the um, the trivia states on INDB that John Woo let Nicolas Cage get all pumped up for a scene before surprising him with the cake. And it resulted in uh, Cage asking Woo not to ever do that again, which I personally thought it was just it sounded weird in itself because it wasn't like there was going to be two birthdays. <laughs> like his birthday wasn't going to come around again on the same production. But um, but did you, it looked to me based on the pictures on your website that this is happening on multiple productions, and he always seemed pleasantly thrilled by the by the cake. It is so I'm assuming that the the trivia is completely false, but I was wondering if you could confirm that. I did. I've never read any trivia. I only I only know what I saw on set. Uh, I don't know what went on behind the scenes, because I'm always on the set. In all fairness, so mm -hmm. uh, on the set, Nick was extremely gracious and and 
pleasantly surprised that we did the cake thing. He was unaware that all that stuff was happening. We kind of knew that it was going to happen, but uh, it would just break and then they would do it. Like on Scorsese said to Michael Bays and so forth. It just happened to be that we're filming in January in the, you know, on these films and John Wu and Cage, I would say are as close as they can possibly be. There was not a second of animosity between them. I think mm -hmm. that those guys were like swinging sisters. They were like buddy buddies the entire time. I don't, you know, the dynamic between those two was, was, it was very close. It was like good buddies, respectable buddies working together. I didn't feel no. anything or saw anything in wind talkers or on face off. Well, you brought up Wind Talkers. I was going to ask you about that because what now we're we're on John Wu. What a few a few years later, you were with John Wu on Wind Talkers. What was it like specifically to work with him? Because it's not just Wind Talkers. It's face off. Like what was it working? Work, yeah, hard talk. Thank you. What was it like to work with him? And truthfully, I love this guy. This guy is a very soft spoken man who barely speaks English, or at the time he barely spoke English, mm -hmm. and is just. He's all about humor and perfection. Now, this guy dances around everything. He's yeah. smart. He's witty. He knows what he wants out of the shot. Verbally, he doesn't relate as well as he does when it comes to visual motion. It's almost like charades. But he gets his point across, and the cinematographer would always collaborate with him. And, of course, they always had um, – producer was Terrence Chang – I also think that he kind of acted as a, as a translator at times. I think they had Sam Raimi on – hard target as like a uh a, a translation or to kind of to help direct their you know be the uh a trans uh translation between you the director and the cast you don't, you ever heard that i i, I have no idea oh, i yeah i just yeah he he's he's one of those directors that you can kind of tell that you're watching one of his films before you see his name in the credits because he has just that kind of visionary style especially when you see the dubs yeah he's a super but, generous guy and he keeps the set as difficult as the set is i'd say and then that's why you know wind talkers was a very hard film logistically and strategically to film in hawaii uh but face off was also hard but there was a dynamic to face off that that is my favorite film to have ever worked on. It was so damn tough to be there for five straight months, but it was because of Wu's presence. Remember, the director kind of sets the tone of how right. everyone else is going to feel. If you have a real antsy, fucked up director, um, <laughs> everyone else is kind of shaking. That's already happened, of course. But when Wu's there, it's all very relaxed, but very professional. And there's always humor induced into everything. If there's, uh, like, he I likes like humor. And, uh, and I like that. loves humor, and uh, and I think that those two really got along well. And I and I I loved working with John Wu. I thought we got along very well. No, no, I, and I can agree with you from every all the research we've done. It seems like like everything you're saying is from what, everything that we've read. Now, speaking of John's, now we saw out of all the again, you have some of the greatest photos ever on your page. So, uh, we saw a nice photo of you and John Travolta on set. And I've had me personally, I've had the opportunity of working with John um, on a set of a film called Lonely Hearts that was actually filmed in Florida here. And so I think I can call him John. He shook my hand and said, "Hey, you're doing great." I was like, "Well, call me in a few years, John, John boy." Uh, <laughs> Now, I, I want to ask you this. What was your experience like working with Mr. Travolta? I liked him an awful lot. You know, uh, I would say that he was he's always one of these jovial, happy people. He breaks character and gets into this That's whole right. social scene on set a lot. Unlike mm -hmm. Cage, who was very methodical about most everything that he did on set. Travolta was this like, you know, Mr. America. It was like he was a celebrity a movie star and an actor, all of <laughs> so when they when they broke, he he goes into this whole. And people talk to him. He talks. He's this. He's that. I was invited to his trailer a few times. Sit down. We have coffee along with you know other people in the entourage. And he was just that guy. Oh, it's like I come on over, sit down, have lunch at the trailer, shoot the shit. He's just like this all the time. The opposite was within a cage who was very into his role and into his character and stuff and kind of reserved the energy for what he was doing on set uh, versus exuding all energy as Travolta was. But he just he went on and on and on. He was just he was like an octopus all the time. Is it is it true that uh, there was like a, a little bit of an overlap in production between Face Off and Con Air? Yes. Hmm. How, how much of an overlap? Like how, uh, I'm just I'm very interested in in 
uh, uh, the, to do one movie is a lot of work, but to do two films at the same time, and especially two action films where you're one the with lead. a mullet and one with no mullet. Yeah, it's <laughs> a lot going on. Yeah. So what was it like? I like a month or a few weeks or to, to what I remember and what I understand, I think it was a maximum of two weeks. They started shooting Travolta scenes, anything to do with JT, ex- anything that excluded cage. They were filming, including some sun, some stunt stuff. And I think mm-hmm. it was about a two week overlap. We had run way over on Con Air. And, uh, and, and at that point they couldn't, th- they were running out of things to film without cage. So they said, you have to come on. So we were working on two film sets at the same time. The hours were like 18 hour days. It was quite insane. Wow. You had your hair, makeup, wardrobe people completely derobing him, putting him into the face off look and then flying, putting him back into the cock. And it was insane to go back and forth. And I was at method standard to also flip back and forth. And it was really exhausting. Did you guys wear the same hairpiece? Uh, we oh, did. Yeah. Well, had his hairpiece. I had like the... <laughs> 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 yeah. All right, your turn. <laughs> you know, I, was, I had the, the stunt guy's hairpiece uh, as needed. You know, at a all certain right, point, you don't really need it because now they know how to light it. So you don't have all to right. go through all that trouble. But it was a lot of stuff because we were immediately went on stage um, for Face Off and we were still doing Con Air. So you would over, we'd finish one film and then go on to the next set. And it was kind of crazy. And the locations were all over the place. I think I was so exhausted just being there because I was a crew member. I was a crew member on two crews. And that lasted several days for that part of it um, mm. until we were finally done with Con Air. So, and if you're doing two productions, that's, then when, where's the sleep? <laughs> there wasn't any. That's wild. And here's the thing. He never fucking complains. I complain that's like a awesome. He didn't <laughs> never, whether you're sick, or tired, you're this, you're that, blah, blah. It didn't matter what it was. He just rolled with it. Hey, Nick, your stand is complaining. He's fine because I'm fine. <laughs> We're fine. <laughs> I, I was a diva. People complained about me for complaining because I was a fucking diva. I was like, dude, I'm exhausted. They're like, shut yeah. up. The actor's not complaining. Well, Why are you complaining? I do know one time that he did complain, and this is one t- one of the actually one of the times I told you that one of my favorite scenes of the film um, for Face Off. Um, after well, no, 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 you don't know though. Well, it's I don't. I, IMDb fact. Well, it's IMDb fact. Well, IMT me thinks it was one of the best scenes in the film. Uh, it, it, IMDb does say we're 50 50 here that Nicolas Cage was so disgusted by the makeup for his faceless scene when his face was removed that John Wu had to remove any reflective surfaces from the line of sight. But me and him, when we did the, the pre- re- review of the film, I said one of my favorite scenes was in the glasses of the doctor, you saw a bloody Castor Troy. And that's one of my favorite scenes of the film because he almost looks like Heath Led- Ledger in the Joker with the fucking smile and smoking the cigarette. I love that shit. I do too. I loved it. I, I actually don't know the backstory of that. The backstory mm. would be a better question with the uh, the writers. Uh, right. They were there yeah. every single day. They're actually friends of mine, and uh, they were on set every single day. And John Wu wanted them on set. They're great guys, and they were co-producers, the creators, and the writers of of the thing. So they would have the right answer. Well, I will say this: we did one of the things me and him both appreciated about the film was that a lot of things were done practically. It wasn't a lot of CGI. Mm-hmm. I mean, most films around the time of Racer and a lot of the films were going so CGI with a lot of things, but Face Off really kept it practical, even with the the plane scene. What, what, what were you, gonna, you didn't think I was going to bring up a Racer? Racer is like that's that's where that's because that was done around the same time. Those fucking alligators got on my fucking nerves. In the uh, Racer. I mean, Fight Club. Uh, but there wasn't any, there wasn't a lot of CGI in Fight Club. Um, yes, the, the, there was no, 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 it wasn't. It was like, this is a weird reference. You just met me at a w- weird time in my life. All right, whatever. Um, <laughs> that, that really yeah. threw me. Did it? Well, uh, I'm gonna take this question. Play, please. We, in each episode, we kind of go through our favorite scenes from the movie. What was your favorite scene in Face Off? You know, I hate to be so generic, but I'm gonna say when he does that whole Face Off thing in the loft. That was my favorite scene because it wasn't in the script. And he executed it brilliantly. <laughs> as much respect as you have for this man, you get you you develop even more respect for him. And I felt so proud to be on that set and to be thinking, look at me, I'm working for this guy, this guy, and who 
I would never in a billion years come near, you know, in, in terms of understanding what he does. And I just felt really privileged to be on that set. So I would say it's that scene was my favorite and, and being in that loft, which is great. I, I have this line that he knows what I'm getting ready to say here. I have this line that I always say, especially when me and him are filming is I don't read the script. The script reads me. There is only one other actor in this world that can use that. And yeah. that is Nicolas Cage because he embodies it. And so, you, yeah, I usually agree. Usually that's such a pet peeve of mine when they say the title of the movie in, in the, the movie in a way. Oh, like, I told right, you I got two, mad at you about two, that. Two credits. Wait, but. He, he made it work in that scene. No. There's, well, a, there's a degree of self-awareness to it. I want to take his face. What about oh, when the when when James Brown is playing in the background and John Travolta says, Papa's got a brand new bag. I'm like, they're playing that. I don't need you to say that to me right now. But OK, I get it. I get it. <laughs> Nicholas Cage can pull it off, though. Yeah, he can. Yeah, that's a great scene. And then as far as the production as a whole, what do you have a favorite memory in particular from the face off production? I, I loved being next to John Wu on the monitor and watching and learning, I will say that that to me was probably the biggest honor of uh, of of my stand in film career. The fact that he invited me to sit next to him often um, mm -hmm. and like next to him as if I was his son. Uh, it was very strange to have that dynamic to be the stand in. But they saw how seriously I took everything and how everything should be done right. And, and I think that he respected that. So I would say that that was probably my favorite thing that happened in terms of closeness. I, I developed a bunch of close relationships with different people on that film set, uh, including my friend Mary, whose house I'm sitting in, who designed the wigs for Nick Cage, who's brilliant, and, and did that and did his hair on that entire film. But, uh, but just being there and watching John Wu and having him ask me questions or to go through the motion and him trusting me to be Nick Cage, even though I'm physically a lot heavier at this point, uh, or at that point, that made me feel like I was included in the VIP list. You know, it's yeah. a real big deal. You don't get that in the in the uh, in the position of a stand-in, guys. This was a very privileged moment. I recognize it as a privileged moment, and uh, and I worked and I respected it, and and that to me was a big deal. I'm I'm glad that you said that because we've interviewed over at this point over 75 guests and there's only a few guests who've said what you've said and and I agree with it. When you're on set, it doesn't matter whether you're a stand-in, a cinematographer, craft services. If someone invites you to do something, they'll soak up all that knowledge because being in film is like being on a golf course. You're gonna need more than one club and you better know how to use all of them. And that way you it's about the end game, it's about the long game. So clearly. Like, I don't, I don't like that you said you're not a great actor, you're not this great talent, because at the end of the day, I mean, that's how you feel. But if I'm a great director, I can still use you in the way that I need to use you because you appreciate what it takes to do what's being done. Yeah. So keep it up. If I ever cast you, you won't be Nick Cage to stand in. I just want to tell you that right now. I'll just tell you that. But let me ask them. I will say this before we move on from Face Off. Is there anything that you want to tell people about the film that they may not know, that may not be on IMDb or that they've never heard? Is there anything that you want to exclusively break on this show about Face Off? Well, that's not on IMDb. I mean, I'm just trying to think of the, like, the general actors and so forth. There was a lot of harmony between the actors. Uh, a lot of downtime because of the setups were just endless, endless, endless setups. Mm -hmm. The stunt guys had their work cut out for them that you may or may not understand, um, especially in the boat scene. Those guys were crazy. And I was on you, on that scene as well. Uh, I was never on that set. I just want you to okay. know. I, I never made it to Thank the you. boat set because it was all stunt. Stunt and actors had nothing to do mm -hmm. with us. So uh, to be very clear, it was all no, no. Well, I'm sorry. You see us both like chomping at the bit to say, listen, you did such a great job. We knew that was not you at the boat scene because we both were like, now, wait a goddamn minute now. Hold on. That was the one funny moment. You don't want a two-year-old horn guys or anything kind of weird because the stunt guy... Right were great stunt guys and they did it. They were. Oh, on. I wouldn't do it. During those scenes, us stand-ins were just on the sidelines doing photo double insert shots on another right. on, a, on another unit. And while right. they went and did all their serious work with stunts, which was quite serious because it was dangerous, um, right. that was with the director and actors and stunt guys. That, there's no reason to drag this luggage 
onto that page. <laughs> there you go. Not- and see, that wasn't CGI, David. That wasn't CGI. That's what I'm trying to tell you. But what we, one well, thing. I didn't you, say it was CGI. You did not. But one thing you did not, I don't even know if you noticed this. We, we again, you say we were film buffs. Like, okay, so we're dressed as priests, which can be considered, I guess, Catholic, somewhat religious Jesus. The one thing that we really love that Nicolas Cage is not standing, stunt double, technically walked on water. Doing that scene on the boat, because remember he got up and he was like riding on water on the side of the boat. We we're like, wait a minute, this, yeah. this <laughs> Jesus priest is riding or walking on water. Shoes too. Well, you saw yeah. that I didn't. Oh, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to abruptly move right into Gone in sixty seconds right now, and I I'm love gonna that. put uh, God, I love that film. Two pictures on the screen that I saw on your website. Jesus, I'm so jealous of you. I'm so jealous of you. Most of the population jealous. Jesus. The, 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 did you see the pictures in the PDF I sent you with the with you and Angelina? Uh, I didn't because I didn't know how to open the things. I tell you, I'm not a tech person, but I know the pictures if they're okay, from my website. Know. I'm well aware. That's of okay. No, they no, can't hand it to me. Thank you. What do you? What do you? Just hand it to this? me. I want to look at it live. I want to look at it live. Thank you, got it. Thank you. Okay. So if you were to, uh, if I were to show these pictures to somebody, I could easily convince people that you and Angelina Jolie were an item in the, uh, in the, in the late nineties. I'm just wondering what the, I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing arm graze, but I, I just want to, I want to appreciate the moment. I want to, uh, <laughs> congratulate you on your good fortune and just ask for elaboration on what happened before and after these photos were taken and and in all seriousness i'm i'm being uh purposefully uh juvenile when it comes to the the photo but with all of your pictures though there is this um it doesn't look like you know you're just some guy that that ran up to a celebrity and asked for a picture with them it seems like there is some kind of mutual respect happening, not just from you to them, but for from them to you. Like Harvey, K- I saw a picture of you and Harvey Keitel and uh, so many people on your website. Um, so I was just wondering what, you know, what happens before and after these photos? When do you find the time or, you know, what, where, where is the opportune time? You are, you're, you are distracting the fuck out of me. Well, I, did, I was looking at the picture. You should, you brought up Angelina Jolie. That's the first time you've done this for four seasons and you want me to be, clacking. you want me to pay attention after you brought up and he's hugging Angelina Jolie. I want to do that my whole career okay, and I'm an actor. Yeah, so if you could just tell us about what, what happens a bit before and after these pictures. Uh, it's, you know, it was it was a very lighthearted set, guys. And so they, the actors would come in and they would step into their marks as we the standards we were setting it up. So I would set up a lot of those scenes. By this point, I'm such a veteran of working for Cage. I kind of like I knew what was happening. I knew the marks. I knew the walk ons. I knew what was going to happen in that scene. And you're just following through because I always pay attention. And so I was to me, it was like a walk in the park. So. Well, it's all set up. She sees how the work is done. She sees you do all the job, you know, whatever you do for Nick Cage as well. And uh, and she comes on and we're like joking. She just talks and I talk. How are you? How are you doing? You look pretty. I like this. I like that. So I'm like, oh, Angeline, like you're going to be standing over on this side because we have this over here. We're going to do the turnaround over here. If you're OK with that. Oh, yeah, sure. And this this conversation was very normal to have. And uh, and so it's like, is it okay if we just have a picture? And she's like, oh yeah, let's hug and kiss. And she was all about hugging and kissing. She was so friendly to me. I was taken back by it. I'll tell you the truth. It was like that from the, the moment we started that film to the very end. At the very beautiful. end, she gifts me a beautiful swift, swift Swiss blade knife with the engraved God in 60 seconds from Angelina Jolie. As a oh gift, I work on the set working as Nick. And I thought, wow, I'm like, this can't be possible. Like, do I deserve that? And she gave it to me. We were in hair and makeup one day, and it was towards the end of the uh, thing because I do my hair. Remember, all this in my hair was all blonde, as you saw. It was completely stripped and, and done. In fact, mm-hmm. the lady whose house I'm at did the hair for that. So nice. she, wow. uh, she was on Gone in 60 Seconds, and she made my hair look exactly to the, to the, to the perfect coloring of Nick Cage. She's a master at it. And, uh, and that's where those photographs come from. It's actually in her house and we had done it. So oh, I would do gosh. their makeup chair because they have to like retweak it for photo double shot. I did a lot of photo doubling and hand things and all that kind of stuff. So 
she's in there, meaning Angelina Jolie, and there I am, and then she gives me this gift um, towards the end and thanking me for my work as a, as a contributor um, to this film. I thought that was... I just, I just want to let you know, if I, if Instagram was out back then, there'd be half of the world that was jealous of you, and the other half be like, it's so fake. It is so fake. But no, we know it's real, man. And hey, listen, you got... It was really real. So I'll, I'm going to tell you this. I mean, adaption is one of my... Oh, no. No, I, I, I knew you were going to do let, I'm you. I have no. to know because I am you. I have to do this. Thank you. Let me do it. Adaption is one of my favorite films. Now, Spike Jones and Charlie Kaufman are a dream team. That film, like all of their films, seems like it came from such an innovative and openly creative space. What was that production set like to work on? Please tell me. Uh, initially, I'll tell you, it was a, it felt a little cold to me. It felt a little disconnected from me to them. That's just, it was like a little cliquey group of the, the writer, the cinematographer, you know, the director and the actors. So I felt very disconnected. I was not included in, in all the reindeer games, the way you would normally feel in the way I was. And, That's um, interesting. And they were, you know, very artsy fartsy. And I'm this kind of glammy kind of stand in guy. And it was a very low budget film. And, and there was a lot of discrepancies about my fees at this point. I'm on a, you know, I'm on an actor salary. I've got residuals. You know, I'm on this big fucking perk list, thanks to Cage and his agent at CAA. And um, so they looked at me like this big goomba showing up. Like, who the fuck is this guy when, like, he's making more money than the producers? Like, get him off the set. So... I, I wasn't really a welcomed sight um, for the first week at least while we were up in the studios in Santa Clarita. So I, I was really not having it and not liking it. But I was shoving my face in there like a raccoon to get through a hole. And I thought, I'm going to prove these fuckers that I'm, I am worth every dime. And, uh, and they wouldn't use me. They were just like using themselves as Nick Cage. And I was like, <laughs> I'm right there with the sides and they're like ignoring me and walking around me. I'm like, so I just shoved myself in there and, and it's like, well, if Nick were here, Nick would be sitting on that couch. And I look at them and I mosey along like a raccoon and I would sit down on the couch knowing how Nick is going to sit in this frumpy, you know, Kaufman kind of way. So I sat there and I did this and then they're like, well, then maybe he would stand by the window. And then I, and I had a fat suit on. So my fat suit, cause the budget was so low, was a pillow with a, with a strap on. And, uh, and a T-shirt over it because they didn't have money to put a fat suit on me. So I made my own fat suit so I could. And then I did the wig thing and cut my hair and dyed my hair as best as I could to resemble, to, to show them how dedicated I was to be that. As you saw in the photographs, I looked a lot like him. Yeah. Um, and all of that was because I insisted on being that person, that character, because that's my job. And so I made a point of it because they weren't going to offer me anything to physically put me there. I got my own stuff with the pillow. I made it all up. I went to Home Depot and I got one of those like back brace things and with the Velcro and I just strapped it on the pillow and threw the t-shirt over me. And I made sure it was the same size as his body. So I had a, the right size pillow, but I went above and beyond to show them. So once I started to like show up and do the scenes, they started to embrace me and embrace me. And by the end of it, uh, we were such a close knit family between the Spike Jones and, and the DP Lance Cord, Lance Accord, and myself that um, Spike Jones wrote a handwritten letter to me thanking me for all the work that I had done and my contribution to his film. And I was Amazing. mind boggled by it because they didn't talk to me at the beginning. At the very end, they're like, "Oh my God, this guy was the greatest thing since sliced bread," and they basically, you know, judge me on my on my appearance and and my and my salary, I guess. But I was worth every nickel of it, and they realized that I did all of it, and they were thrilled. So it became a really close knit, fun, artsy fartsy film, and and I enjoyed that aspect of it. I want I want to ask this because. Um... Me and him talk about this all the time. Like I work half the time for I, I I tell my daughter all the time when I'm at work during the day, that's my fake job. Like I'm Bruce Wayne, even though I'm not a billionaire. And at night, I'm my real job is Batman because I'm acting or I'm voice acting or doing something like that. So I, what I want to ask you, this is that a lot of a, part, a major part of your career has relied on being a stand in for for Nick Cage. And I want to know, is that anything that's stressful or it's kind of like, well, I know Nick's going to get work. So, I mean, I'm going to get work. So. 
Is it kind of like, hey, Nick, what you're doing? You want to, you want to, you, I guess you, if there's one actor you want, never will have to ask, are you doing anything? It's Nick Cage. So is it stressful? It's like, I'll just, what's Nick got going on? Uh, it's, it's not me asking so much as opposed to there's a whole team and entourage at that time. Okay. And the okay. entourage is, is very communicative of who's coming and going on the next film. And mm-hmm. I was always part of the checklist of being on the next film. So it was after a while, it was a given that I'm going to be on, on the films. And I, I kind of gave up everything else. And I said, okay, I'm going to ride this thing and I got to keep working. Right. Um, and we'll see where it goes until I burnt out, which I did towards the end. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and all in all, I was investing, um, uh, you know, into real estate, uh, just so I didn't, I wasn't going to be left out in the cold, but, uh, I felt like I was part of that entourage and I was included and, uh, and I was being flown around, um, you know, the semi VIP status, which was really great, um, versus flying coach, <laughs> you know, it's, it was, you know, it was. Perks of the studio. It's it's just how it worked at the time. I'm not sure if it yeah. worked for me today, but uh, at the time it was. I was really a part of it. Your last stand-in role was to, uh, Weatherman in 2005. What? What it actually year? was? Uh, just to correct you, it was actually that was the release date, but the actual filming was Lord of War was the last one, and we filmed the video. Oh, okay. They were released in 05. Gotcha, okay. gotcha. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah. IMDb. Check those production. No, that's probably me. Yeah, the production. <laughs> I, I'm looking at the release, not the production. Um. So what? What? What ultimately led to your decision to move on and uh, uh go go on this other path? Well, initially, I was I was kind of putting the fielders out there on National Treasure, and I was quite exhausted. And Nick has Mr. Cage has endless energy. I hate to say it, but he truly is Superman. He does have superpowers. I'm not going to really beef him up and tell him that. Th- but the truth is, this fucking guy has superpowers. This guy is never tired. This guy will work 15 hours a day, five hours, 22 hours a day, never fucking complains and just does it. He doesn't care if he's like going up a mountain or driving through the desert. It's fine. He's in character and he's good with it. Me, as a stand-in, which is a crew member, a crew member with perks, I was exhausted. And and the physicality of, of being around all that was was wearing on me. So on National Treasure, I really wanted to quit after National Treasure and audit. Because in National Treasure, we worked on f- in five states over five months. Oh, there was a lot fair, of a lot of road moving, you know, from the peaks of Utah up in the mountains when we were digging out on that snow, which was right. a nightmare to be on, uh, all the way to New York City, all within the same film. Um, and you're just in this caravan of months and months. You had no life. And I was building up other things in my life. And I was just overwhelmed. And then then came the weatherman after that. And I didn't want to work on it just because of Chicago winters. And I thought, well, maybe this will be my last film because it's I'll go off on a winter film as I started on a winter film and I'm going to call it a day. And as it turned out, that film gave me pneumonia. I had the flu. Wow. I was so fucking sick on that film set. You I might. mean, Nick was sick as well. He was he was physically ill, you know, with sinus infections and ear infections because we were outside in trench coats in Chicago in the winter. So because mm-hmm. the character was in a trench coat, but the crew was were in parkas, you know. So it was really hard to be be that stand in uh, in a trench coat and and doing the bow and arrow for four hours of a setup when your fingers are blue you know there was no joy in it and i thought okay this is it i gotta get off this fucking set i gotta quit i am done Um, i fell in love with chicago but i felt out of love with the film business and and Mm. the the amount of ego of getting a shot done and the perfectionism of being on a set with with how everything had to be so perfect at the cost of our health and at this point guys i'm 40 plus and i was tired i had made some good money i invested very well and i thought in my head okay the career has been fine but if i do this i'm never going to get fired i'm never going to get out of this and i see other people who've been in it for a thousand years and i thought i'm not a film buff I need to get out of this and restructure my life before I become too old and I, I just need to get out of this. This is the wrong thing forever. And do something you love. Pardon? They definitely do something. I say and say and do something you love. A quick connection. If you've ever seen our show, we do this thing called Connections. And you mentioned, he mentioned uh, the uh, National Treasure. Uh, you know who played Nicolas Cage's father in National Treasure, do you not? 
Was it John Voight? It was John Voight. Who's John Voight's daughter? Angelina Jolie. Going in 60 seconds. That's what we do. That's, just, that's what we do. And you, uh -huh. that's what we do. The uh, you, were, you were also a stand-in um, over the years for uh, William Baldwin, Daniel Baldwin, Steve Gutenberg, Pierce Brosnan, Richard Grieco, Norman Reedus, Judd Nelson, Tony Shalhoub, Anthony LaPaglia, and, and many others. Um, of those jobs, I'm wondering if there was like a particular production or actor that was the most gratifying to work with. Out of those, God damn. Um, <laughs> not, um, I would say, uh, in terms of fun, I would say it was uh, Pierce Brosnan on Mars Attacks. Uh, I had a blast on that. And these were, I just want to say that all those names you read off and all those films that you read off were what I called filler films. So they were between Nick Cage films. I was so in demand as a stand-in in both Los Angeles and Toronto, if you can believe it at this point, that I became the stand-in of Hollywood that any time Nick was off for six weeks, they called me to go in and stand in for some other actor uh, wow. just because they knew what they were going to get. And yeah. it was so fucking bizarre to be not an actor, but a, a stand in for all these big named actors because the casting directors and the ADs and the producers knew that you were going to deliver and yeah. uh, on a set. And I didn't realize I had that reputation. So I did all these filler films. So, like, can you come in and do, you know, Boondock Saints? I'm like, well, I'm going to go and do the Scorsese film in the beginning of, I think it's in September with Cage. And they're like, well, can you come and work for two or three weeks on it? You know, I'm like, yeah, I guess. I didn't have the time, but I said, sure. I was always saying yes. And then I'd say, well, I have to leave in two days. I said, I've got to quit as of now. Are you sure we don't want you to leave? Hang out on the set. And then I had fun with like William Baldwin. I'm sorry, with William, William Defoe on the set and the director, Troy Duffy, and went to a party and stuff. Like it became a real social thing where I became this celebrity stand in. They just wanted like Nick Cage's stand in on set. It was like a put him in as a guest spot. And, and mm -hmm. it became this weird fucking thing. So I did all these other films as filler films because I was around. They're like, are you in Toronto? Yeah. You know, we're doing a film with like William Baldwin. Do you want to come in and work for him? Well, he's six foot three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Just, just show up on the set. And oh my gosh. it became that. And it was really weird. And when it was all over with Cage after Lord of War, I never went on a film set again. I oh was, my gosh. I, it's just like I OD'd on filmmaking. Standing in for Nicolas Cage will do that, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, you're getting you're getting 20 years of filmmaking in 10 years doing uh or, doing the following Nicolas films. Cage's schedule or 10 films. I, I was going to ask you what was the most challenging production that you worked on, but I think you actually spoke to it is when you actually said enough's enough when everybody's in parkas and some people are in trench coats. So I'll ask you this: for aspiring actors slash most popular stand-ins ever. What advice would you offer to the up and coming person who wants to get into the industry? Oh, uh, well, I always tell people don't get into the industry to be a stand in. I mean, it, these are these are default positions. So anybody yeah. who is a stand in was an actor of some sort who didn't really make it. But you kind of stay in the unions and in the industry because you don't really have anything else to go with. And most people don't have a backup plan that's going to afford you basically medical plans because the Screen Actors Guild medical plans. You're on film sets. There is a certain notoriety of being on a film set, whether you're a stand-in on ER or NYPD Blue or anything to that effect. There's a certain clout and people like that. So people, these are defaulted actors like myself who didn't really make it, but we're fortunate enough to be in the unions and we kept our union cards so we keep up. But I, I tell people it's not a lifestyle choice to be a stand-in, though there are people now who have who continue it, like uh, Leah, no, Taylor Leone stand-in, lovely lady. Uh, I'd spoke to her a few times. Um, and she had done a lot of, she, she'd done all that, the, the series in New York. And, and a lot of them just keep doing it because they don't really know what else they're going to do. But it was never something they really wanted to do. So getting into the industry, there's a variety of positions. I always tell people, and I'm going to tell that to you guys, I always say keep your day job because the film business is really not caught out to be what anybody really thinks it is, whether you're a hair person, whether you're doing wardrobe, um, whether you are uh, a grip. Um, it, does, it doesn't matter what the position is unless you are that above the line meaning you are the mm -hmm. writer you're the director you're the cinematographer you are that one percent everybody else becomes a working stiff 
And if you think you're going to really break through, you're fooling yourself because you really don't break through at all. And I would say that 99% of the people don't break through and then they get miserable, they get bitter, they go into drinking and drugging, or they fall into some stupid, badass career that they hate, or some silly job that they can't stand, but they don't know what to do. So... Mm -hmm. I, I, I really believe that you should have a solid back, um, a backup plan and something that is far away from show business because it, it really is a fluffy business on the outside and it's a workaholic business on the inside. And everybody's successful because they're workaholics, not because they're fucking around and sleeping around or doing drugs. That's the opposite. So okay. it's a tough business. The hours are tough. The locations are tough. The lifestyle is tough. I don't recommend it for the general person. I got out of it and I was thrilled. Um, and, and I had the opportunity to invest in things to allow me to get out of it. Well, speaking of things you've invested in, though, and I don't mean to cut you off, but you did invest in something. You clearly you have a passion for. Clearly, we're doing a simulcast, but you actually have a podcast, the BBB or B squared, as we, me and David call it here, Babble, Bullshit and Beyond, available directly on Marco Kyrus.com. Let me do this again. Marco Kyrus.com. As well as iTunes. So you can use that. I'm not even going to charge you. Tell us how you got into that, why you did it. Clearly, you have a passion for it, and you're nobody stand in for that. You are the man. So talk to us about it. I just wanted to talk about film stories and, and bring my past film experience to people that I've also worked with who were in the film business. And I just think it's kind of fun because we all have that experience in, in one way or the other in the film business in different capacities. And that's why I started to do it. And I just thought it'd be kind of interesting. I've been a little lackluster in, in 2021 because I've been building up my personal projects and it's taken away a lot of time uh, during this pandemic thing, but I'm mm -hmm. going to go back into it much more. Um, and I'm lining up guests when I get back to Toronto um, to do it. I think it's a lot of fun to do. And I like talking about the industry, but I like talking about the good, the bad and the ugly. I don't want to fluff it up because it's anything but a fluffer business. It is the mm -hmm. opposite of fluff. You know, it's more fucked than it is fluffed. Yes. So, yes. 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 You, yes, you get, you fucking get it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I think that if people, they're 21 years old or even 31 years old and think that, you know, there's, there's some greatness to it. There really isn't. Um, it's just a lot of hard work and most of it is missed work and missed out opportunities on life. So I always tell people, if you can do something else and enjoy the real world that you really live in, it's much more interesting than the film business. And, uh, and you could be a film buff and enjoy films versus being in them so much. So that's, that's always my, I think the only reason I did all this battle bullshit and beyond with the podcast and, and did that short film, which actually won all these awards, strangely enough, um, is I want to go back and tell my story in a feature film, which is why I'm also in LA, which I'm producing and obviously starring in my own thing. I want to tell the story. It's a unique story, but I, we want to do it over a, a documentary and then a docu-series and then I'm writing the book uh, nice. of, of, uh, of my world, where I came from, where I got lost, and where I kind of picked up, and where Cage kind of saves me, kind of like Superman, you know, saves Lo Lois Lane. I felt mm -hmm. like I was Lois Lane. And, uh, and uh, he, he really was my savior when it came to that. And I got so lucky. And then I made the luck work for me. So I had that circumstance that was amazing, but I didn't. I didn't, uh, I didn't rest on that. You know what I mean? I, I worked that as well. And I worked it to my financial advantage. Well, congratulations yeah. on the success at the film festivals with um, Uncaged. Uh, is there, is that available anywhere right now to watch or? No, it's, it's not just a trailer is because I don't have the right to like put it all out there yet. Um, okay. This feature film will be once it's done because I'm owning the rights to everything. So it looks I'm great. I'm the producer of it. So yes, this will be once once it's all kind of like said and done. Um, I'll keep you guys posted on that. Uh, we're just in the middle of it right now. Awesome. Have you uh, have you seen the preview for Cage's new film, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, the one that's kind of loosely based on a super realistic version of himself? Yes. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I think it's a brilliant idea. And I wish I was a producer of it. <laughs> that's, that's a, I read that his agent is one of the producers. 
And I thought, what a smart move the agent uh, made to, to co-produce. I'm not sure if he's financing it or not, but I would love to finance that. Um, in my opinion, I think it's going to be kind of like a, a, a comeback film for him. And, uh, and, and he's making fun of himself. You know, he gets it. He's in on the joke. He gets mm -hmm. all of it. And he's going to play it and work it. And he's, he's going to, you know, he's just playing around with it. And I think it's, uh, it's going to bring in a good audience. Uh, that is amazing. And I, I want to ask you this now. You don't have to do it. I know it's been a while and it's been since 2004, technically, even though it came out in 2005. And he already said that it's setting yourself up for failure to try to mimic Nicolas Cage. I, I really, well, John Travolta is the, he did, he did the best impersonation we've ever seen here. But can, if you don't mind, and you can say no, can you give us your favorite Nicolas Cage line and your best Nicolas Cage impression out of any film that he's ever done? That you didn't have to be the stand in, just in general. Okay, I'm always so embarrassed to do it. I've already done it on that film, uh, but I, I I feel like I don't know. I'm not in the mood for it, so I'm gonna do it, and then you can cut it out if it really sucks because it's gonna kind of okay. Suck. Fair but, enough. Fair enough. You know, it's just like uh, you know, with Gone in sixty seconds. I think I thought he was so good in Gone in sixty seconds. Personally, he was. Uh, he was great, and and I liked him as the as the, as the as the blonde dude boy. Like he was blonde dude boy <laughs> guy. And and to me, I mean, I bought it and I was watching him work through it, but it's just like, you know, I'm a little wired, I'm a little tired. So cover some freaking slap. Yeah. Are you, and you didn't want to do that? Are you, hey man, hey. I feel and that's you not wanting to do it. Like I you, uh, yeah, that was that was that was fucking awesome. <laughs> I've We're using that. I closed my eyes. Yeah. That, I didn't have to close my eyes. He was pointing at me and shit. He was doing the fucking. I That's so funny too that you're like, come on, Nick, can you uh, be the cool guy more? You're always getting these sad sack ho hum roles. <laughs> like, we can we get to wear a leather jacket? We get to have. And I want to tell you this. I looked online. There's no picture of him hugging Angelina Jolie like that. So yes, there is too. Well, I'm not like that. <laughs> um, Marco, before we say goodbye, thank you so much for for coming on, first of all. And uh, are there any parting words that you'd like to leave the audience with? Just in terms of the business, I'm not trying to be a, a, a Debbie Downer at all. I just want to say, think about life. Think about, you only have one life to live. Think about the clarity of where you may want to go. Don't think abstractly like I did. I'm going to be some actor. You should already have been studying and working all kinds of things if you really want to do it, unless you're going to become some reality idiot. Um, and then, and that's fine, but uh, you don't really need much of anything when it comes to that. But if you really do take it seriously, whether you want to be a hairdresser in the business and get into the unions and stuff, understand that the workload is 12 to 14 hours a day. You're not going to be seeing your friends, your family, your kids, your this and your that. You're going to, um, the, the priority is always the filmmaking. So think about life because life is about living. And in the film business, it's all about pretending to live. And, uh, and, and it's not real. It's just a lot of hard work to show the world that they're they're there's you know there's they're they're just trying to tell a story. But uh so I'm just you know and keep yourself clean during that process um if you're working it because if you're not you're you're out the door and people aren't interested in fuck ups. And I saw okay. that with a bunch of fuck ups on film sets who are not working so much anymore. Uh, oh, you've seen that in our own film sets, have we not? Yeah. Yes, we have. Oh, no, that's great advice. That's awesome. I, hey, listen, I, I personally want to just thank you and say, man, listen, you were a blast. Hopefully, we were everything as advertised, like, like literally. Like, I truly enjoyed this, and this is awesome, brother. Let's do it again sometime. Okay. I really appreciate it. I, I love it. You guys are amazing. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Barco. You too. Thank you, thank you so it much, was a great man. talking to you.